Philip, thank you very much for joining me on the Forte podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. And thank you very much for inviting me to your home. Not at all. It's a pleasure. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been around a year or so since you announced your retirement from the concert stage. Yes, I think it would be almost exactly a year. Yes. Exactly a year. How has uh, retirement been and has it been what you expect it to be? Well, retirement, uh, I think that means different things to different people. Uh, I mean, in a sense, one never retires. I've always been baffled by people saying, you know, what will I do when I retire? I feel as though, as I might have said, I, I've come out of a sort of 50-year lockdown. And I, I'm at a place where I think, well, what, what, what the hell was all that about? And now I can get on with all the things I really want to do. So retirement, for me, is a, there's a sense of catching up on lost time. Um, so it, I'm finding every day an adventure. And what are those other interests? I think the other interests are chiefly wanting to write. I think it's really, really coming down to, to that. Um, uh, you know, after 50 years of, can it be 50 years? More even, of playing and of teaching. Um, there's a sense, uh, a growing sense I've been feeling that, that um, I feel there. I want to say something. Now, I, I'm aware that many people want to say something and there's probably a book in all of us. And why should I be any more interesting than anybody else? And of course, I think... <laughs> I'm in danger of thinking, well, I don't know about you, but I find myself very interesting. But I mean, there could be an, an arrogance in that. And I think there probably is in a conceit, but I, I fully admit to probably having all those faults. Um, but it, it, I have had a rather extraordinary life, I think, in the, in the people I've met and the sort of career I've had. And I've been um, putting down a few thoughts. Um, and one of them is why why did I embark on, on the career that I did? Or why did I attempt it? Um, you know, in, in all the years of teaching, especially in college teaching, because I've loved doing adult amateurs, and really in particular, but I've done conservatory teaching for a long time. And I have to be honest and say that there are many people I have taught, and there, there have been quite, quite a few, who really ought not to have been in, in a music college and that they would have been better served if they just enjoyed their ability, such as it was, and in some cases, such as it wasn't, um, as an amateur, and just you know play in private and do private concerts for charity or the local church, or whatever it may happen to be, and not think of having a public career. And I've been thinking, you know, um, what, flowing from that, what do we mean by talent? So often I've been asked over the years, have you got anybody talented? Are you teaching anybody talented? You know, with great excitement. And um, I feel I don't want to disappoint them and say, well, no, I haven't got anybody particularly interesting. So I say rather rather foolishly um, and, and provocatively, um, everybody's talented. Everybody's got something unique and something special. And talent isn't any one thing. It's a cocktail of things. You know, some people can have a talent for playing Chopin waltzes, but can't play Beethoven for a toffee. And, it, you know, there's many, many, many things. Some people can't sight read, but can still play wonderfully. It, it's many, many things. And I think we need to have a much clearer idea of what we mean by talent. And just because you have an ability to do something doesn't mean to say you have to do it. So these, these are things I've been thinking about. And... And my story is is of somebody who loved playing the piano as a boy 
um, and showing off, for sure. But really, it was not ever um, a sort of... Uh, I didn't think of being a pianist. I just enjoyed playing the piano. It was, it was not a big deal. Uh, and then I came to enjoy model making, for example. I was a great DIYer, I still am. And I love practical things. I like decorating. I like uh, um, all, all those kind of things. But also, I, I loved playing the squeeze box, the melodeon, and the piano accordion when I was a boy. And we had a schoolmaster who was um, a Morris dancer. And he took it upon himself to start a boys' team of Morris, Morris boys. And I used to watch him in the playground struggling with this button key accordion uh, and trying to teach the boys. And I asked him if I could have a girl on the, on the thing and he lent it to me one weekend and I could play it by Monday. And so I had the job of playing uh, for the boys and I loved that. And I learned a whole lot of repertoire of English song, uh, dances, folk songs and dances. It was a wonderful training. And I loved this little melodium and decorating the, the, the tunes and sometimes putting them into different keys to give people a sort of lift. Um, and that also helped me in for pulse and steady rhythm and all these things. But I loved doing that. And then when I went to boarding school, um, the organ, which had already swung into view, was, was, was another great, great interest. Um, and all these things were sort of... And it wasn't really till I was about four... I never listened to music or had any particular interest. I listened to Russ Conway and Winifred Atwell, as I was mentioning earlier. I, I thought they were great. And I used to slow down the records. They were 45 RPM in those days. And you could slow them down to sort of six... I think it was 16. Our record player was 16, 45 and 33 and 78 if you want to. So I could hear everything growling away, an oct two octaves sort of down, listening to every passing note, every nuance, every inversion, seeing just now, I mean, that's it then, playing up speed, and then, is that right? Is that what it was? And um, of course I was giving myself the best oral training you could possibly wish for. Um, I had pitch, which was quite handy. Um, and so I found all those things, uh, absolutely absorbing and I, I, I sort of I, I obviously impressed people with all this but I didn't sort of play Beethoven. I had no interest in playing Beethoven sonatas I did my grades and I had a wonderful teacher Marjorie Withers from the age of seven and she had been a laureate at the Royal Academy of Music in the 1920s and she just happened to be live in Jails Cross as I, I did They'd moved there, she and her husband, just before the war. Her husband, Bertie Withers, Herbert Withers, was a well-known cellist and um, head of strings at the Royal Academy of Music, 30 years her senior. But they were, it was a happy marriage. And she was a great, a very great teacher. And I was so lucky, of course, teaching is so important, as we know. And um, she gave me the sort of pieces that I loved. Um, I can remember... York Bowen, the romp from the second suite. Um, I introduced Stephen Huff to York Bowen. I always like to flag that one up. Um, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, um, Grieg's Wedding Day, Trollhagen, and, and, and pieces like that. And, you know, I loved playing those because they were sort of virtuosic pieces. And I, I, I just enjoyed the physicality of playing them and the fact that I was giving pleasure to people, I think that gave me a buzz. But it didn't make me think, oh, I want to play more, I want to play more, or other things. Then I went back to my Russ Conway in, in private, keeping it slightly under wraps, although Mrs. Withers knew I was loved all that. Mm. Um, and so I went through my grades and, and did all the stuff dutifully. I was a, a sort of quite dutiful about that and um, obedient. And, and that, that carried forward into my career, which might come on to later. But but that's sort of my formation. And it, it, but when I went to boarding school, um, it was only when I was about fourteen or fifteen. I think I went. I was fourteen. It was when I was about fifteen. Um, the director of music, Roger Bevan, lovely man, 
uh, was giving me an organ lesson one Monday morning. And he said to me, um, Philip, have you ever thought of being a pianist? And you know, I don't think I have. It hadn't really crossed my mind. I was quite happy sort of doing what I was doing. Um, and it, it did sow a bit of a seed. And then my father and my aunt, his sister, still alive, 102 tomorrow, took me to the Royal Festival Hall to hear Julius Catron, the great pianist. And he was playing, amongst other things, I think I actually went on two occasions, but the occasion I remember was when he played the Brahms Paganini Variations, which I was then learning. And I can remember, I can remember so vividly um, being in, in awe uh, and bowled over, but feeling quite cross because he played it better than me. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure that this is the the ideal sort of way of firing a young um, young person to, for, for a musical career, but I just thought I can do that. I did feel that quite strongly. I can do that. And then. I think about that time I was in, of all places, a tea shop with my mother in Beaconsfield, only a few miles from where we're sitting. And I said to my mother, I think I, I, think I want to become a pianist. <laughs> it might have been just what I was feeling that afternoon. I was in the just, I think I want to become a <laughs> pianist. Um, and so it all sort of things started to move from, from there. And I took grade eight in the piano I took grade eight in the organ first at, at Downside Abbey on the great four manual Compton there and got um, very high distinction in that. And then I took grade eight piano and got a, a lower distinction. I, I got higher marks in the organ, which I, I rather enjoy that. I've been savoring that in my old age, thinking, mm, I wonder, I wonder. So that's uh, that's what happened, and uh, and then I went. Oh, I had a little audition with two visiting artists. They came to give a a duo concert at Downside, my school, Downside Abbey, and it was the violinist Freddie Grinke, Frederick Grinke, and Jeffrey Prattley, the pianist, lovely man. And Roger wheeled me out and said, "Look, we got this boy, and um, he can play the piano and." Would you have any suggestions? So I sat down and did my party piece. And they said, oh, I think, uh, yes, well, how about Philip going to the academy? And we suggest he study with Gordon Green. So it was as sort of simple as that, at one level. Um, so that meant having an audition with Gordon, going up to Thoreau Academy, which I see in a recent diary was January the 5th, 1964. I went to the Royal Academy and uh, met Gordon Green for the first time. And he was lovely, affable, trail of pipe smoke everywhere. I mean, you'd be arrested today. You wouldn't be allowed to do anything like that. Oh, happy days, you know. Um, the hall porter was liveried, I can remember. I mean, it's just, just laughable when you think about it. And there was a profess professorial dining room and the students had a separate cafeteria you know, apartheid between the two things, absolutely f marvellous, you know. I'd go back to that like a shot if I could. Um, and so uh, so there I was at the Royal Academy of Music, and that might be a good point at which I should let you ask me another yes. question. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that uh, summarisation. It's very helpful. <laughs> um, it's interesting that you mentioned and also read about you saying that there's a huge tendency for people to see talent as a, a necessary sort of push towards a particular career. Mm. If someone is very talented at something, yeah. it's almost as if they should do that or need to do that. Yeah. And it just sort of automatically equates talent with enjoyment. It's just not necessarily the case. Sometimes you could be really good at something, but not necessarily yeah. naturally enjoy it. I think this is very, very interesting. I've, I've just been um, looking at an extraordinary documentary on Van Cliven, mm. and I've never really sort of followed 
his story. I've, of course, I've known about him and his great success way back in, what was it, 1958 or 9 in Moscow and all that. But I've never really heard his playing or, or known about it, but I did, did happen to. And, you know, his he had an extraordinary meteoric career, and yet somehow, and he played, as we all know, stupendously in every, every way. I mean, just, just extraordinary. And yet, it didn't somehow, after a certain point, gel and develop. And I, I was thinking, knowing that I was going to chat to you today and having thought about these things quite a lot in recent years, um, this whole question of talent is a highly complex one. And I, I, I don't know whether it's been, it's, 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 it's addressed sufficiently. You know, it, teaching is, is, a, is about so many things as, as a talent is about so many things. And I, I, thinking about myself, which is, you know, one, one can't help but do that. Um, people like to own a bit of your talent. They want to have, be part of it. They want to, it's a sort of, um, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, I think, I think teachers and parents have got to be immensely difficult, uh, careful about how they um, deal with young people who show talent, uh, ability, um, because ch a child will want to please, will want to show off. It's in the you know will, by and large, I think that's that's probably true, um, but that doesn't mean that that is their destiny. I mean, it can in in many instances, but I I think there are many instances equally where it, where it doesn't, and I don't think people can spot the difference sometimes, mm. and. I certainly have, and I'm sure many people who might listen to this interview will know the immense damage that could be caused by a sort of subtle pressure, expectation, mm. and, and all these things. I mean, and I've certainly, in my teaching experience, had to pick up the pieces of, I have to say, quite well-known names and, and, and who... who you know, still doing good work, but in private, they're, they're really struggling. And I think all this needs to be thought about very, very much indeed. And the whole business of training, I think we, we, we need to think about the whole audition process needs to be fundamentally reviewed. Um, but this business of owning, owning, owning talent is... Uh, I think a very, very dangerous thing. I've seen it time and time again. Mm. Anyway, I, I could talk more about it, but I think we better... Please do, if you have. Well, it, it, um, you see, the, it, the whole arena of competition, education has become so sort of competitive assessment culture. This, this constant wanting to... Um, test and to uh, there's no sense of a, a continuum of study in tranquility it's deadline after deadline it's it's you know you've, you've got to do this by that time and all the rest of it i mean that's going to that'll come in your life in the fullness of time but in your study t period which is probably three or four years it's a precious time to hone your craft and to to learn experiment with repertoire not just uh, I'm going to learn this piece I'm going to learn it and then I'm going to perform it we all have to do that but but also to explore to pick things up and to put them down and to just you know have time tranquility space uh, it's and the, the, the modern era we, we it, it just doesn't seem possible and then on top of that we have this wonderful in many ways revolution with technology which is a great gift used correctly, but an absolute scourge if used incorrectly, and is so open to abuse. And, and you know, the, the, the phone, the, the, this idea of being in constant communication, you know, always available, all the time. Um, I think we've got to be very, very careful about this. And I remember Gordon Green, he used to say, and this is years ago, before all this had really taken off, the trouble today, and he was saying this 40, 50 years ago, is that too many people play too well too soon. 
and I think you could say that somebody like Van Cliven would fit into that category, if you like, and uh, many, many, many others. Um, I certainly didn't fit into that category. I think I, pro I probably paid too well too late <laughs> <laughs> when I come to think about it, which is sort of bad. But actually, having said that, I feel, I feel, you want, I want you to switch off the camera. I need to think about that. Um, but I think there may be a truth in that. Uh, we live in an age where we're not allowed to develop in our own time. We all have to develop. We're all sort of force-fed. Uh, everything has to be microwaved. I would say to students, you know, microwave performances. I'm all for slow cooking. Microwave has its place and wonderful. It's a wonderful accessory, provided you have the, the con convection oven as well. Mm. And I think... I, I think those are things to be be borne in mind, um, but, but competition. This this idea of competing, um, I think, can affect the way people play. If you've got this the, the eye on on the on achievement, prize, recognition, rather than your ear on the music, and. Um, I've become more and more interested. I, I think I said earlier that I have a horror of noise, um, and I count music. I, I put music in, into that category. I think one, well, f f for myself, I music is not music if I am not in the right mood. It's just a noise. When you turn that noise off, you know, and it might be a Mozart symphony, it might be anything. Where it, 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 you know, it, it just. And th this business of silence, and, and I like to say that music is a tapestry of sound woven in a loom of silence. And it's like a painting which can only exist on a blank canvas, otherwise it's nothing. And, you know, I, th I, I sometimes hear myself saying to a student or telling a student, um, well done after they played something but I, I haven't heard enough silence in your performance enough silence you know, it's, it's, it hasn't got enough air it, you know, I, it doesn't breathe it's all too compressed, it's too anxious um, So this attitude was it something you've always had or was it something you No I can't truthfully say I've, I, I, I think it's probably always been there at some point but it's taken the form of, of uh, what form has it taken? It's taken the form of always enjoying being on my own in, in silent places, particularly churches or monasteries come to that. Um, uh, because I think silence is, it's not, it's not noiselessness. I think it's in silence that you hear everything. <laughs> That's a powerful statement. Well, I think I think it's I think it's true. And coming back to the business of noise, um, and practicing, for example, I can remember as a student, uh, and I, it, it used to make me cringe, and it still does. Uh, I used to overhear students saying, "Oh, I've done uh, five hours practice today," mm -hmm. and then the, another student said, "Oh, I've done six, You know, mm -hmm. um, and I think, oh. I mean, now to me, and I, Ashkenazi said to me, this is one of my lines, I can say, look you in the eye, Ashkenazi said to me when I was with him on one occasion, if anybody has to practice more than four hours a day, they're in the wrong business. And Shura Chikaski, whom I knew very well, and I could um, tell you a few stories about him, mm -hmm. uh, he used to say that he practiced four hours to the second and he meant that. Um, and I, I think people practice far too much. They, you know, they make too much noise, wear out the piano, and don't listen to a, a thing they're doing. Um, it sounds rather harsh, but I, I, I do feel that. Um, yes. I was thinking of, of Van Cliburn, who I saw last night for the first time. And he said he, in an interview about 15 years ago, he, um, he said that he uh, 
practice with the lid of the piano closed. Well, I've always done that. Um, Mazevich always had, because I had his pianos, and we'll come to that later, practice with the piano closed. But I go down the corridors of college, and these tiny little rooms, with t far too big a piano in them anyway, lid full open, and the student crashing away, sort of giving themselves a phantom concert. You know, they're not, they're not in a practice room. They're in the Albert Hall or the Festival Hall. And, you know, you just cannot hear the subtlety of playing and colouring and the nuancing of pedalling. And if you're doing that, it just cannot be possible. And if there's a choice of two instruments, for example, a, a Steinway and a non-Steinway, and you have a choice, you can be sure that people will practice on the Steinway. For sure. And I always used to make a point in my room of not giving the lessons on the Steinway. I always gave it on the the other piano, and I won't mention the name, um, because I always say to people, you know, you've got to make a Zender upright, a Bentley upright sound like a Model E Steinway. And unless you can do that, I don't want you to play a Model E Steinway. You know, it's, it's you know, I want to, if you've developed your hearing and your ability to, to, to get the sounds you want, you'll be able to get them on anything. But it's, we live in a world that, that, that I don't know, it's, it seems extraordinary to be, you want to be a racing driver and you start learning on a Rolls Royce. seems to be the wrong way to do it. Yes. <laughs> so do you think technology had a big part to play in that, in this change in... Oh, yes, for sure. Technology. I mean, when you, when you look back, I mean, even a recording... It, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, the, the real greats, the great performers and great singers of the early part, mid part of the last century, they wouldn't have heard so many great artists in their day. They would have had to go to concert halls or take a train mm. somewhere, or mm. once or twice a year they might have gone to, you know, when they were young, hear a great artist. Of course, now we just flick a switch. But, and I wonder whether that accounts for the fact that in many ways we don't have I mean where are the Cortos and the Pelereskis and the Shorachakaskis where are they well they don't exist and they can't exist because um, every person who learns an instrument be it violin or voice or, or what, whatsoever they will have many recordings that they've heard and a distillation of all of that whereas the Chikaskis and the thing they didn't they had to. They had one or two, well, more than that, experiences in their life of perhaps hearing a great performance, and, and a, they had their teacher, and their own imagination and resources. And we don't now. We don't have that. We we we're, we're too. It's a, we live in a noise that's too much is thrust at us. There's too, the tyranny of choice. I don't know why it is that people think you've got freedom of choice. I have I it, it's it free it's an absolute tyranny. You know, you go into a large supermarket. Um I think I, it, and in America it's, it's just uh, and even here I, I go into a, a big asda and I want a tube of toothpaste and I go to the tooth and it's a whole a whole corridor a whole you know, of every flavor and color and size and uh, and then if I want a toothbrush, I, I, you get these highly engineered ones that I wouldn't even know how to work. <laughs> um, uh, it's the most extraordinary. Or or a bottle of water, which I don't do now, but you can't. Eat, I mean, you get lime and this and that. I just want a bottle of water <laughs> and a packet of crisps, but you can get vanilla crisps and cheese. You know, and then I just stumble out in confusion. I just don't, don't know what to get, so I don't get anything at all. Mm. Just go, if there's a corner shop, I'll go there and get whatever's on the shelf. The tyranny of choice. I always remember when I did the um, Moscow camp competition in 1978. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. There were three British pianists, uh, Christian Blackshaw, another Gordon Green student and a friend, um, me, and the young Terence Judd, God rest his soul, because he died not so very long after that, in 1978. And um, we were quite popular. It was, it was rather rather pleasant. Um, and I can remember the effect of going to Moscow, and it was still very, very much a communist country then. 
I think it was, was it Brezhnev era? Around that time, probably. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, and I can remember staying in this huge, great modern hotel, Hotel Rossier, which has actually been demolished. But it was a great 1960s sort of Swiss Soviet hotel. But I mean, or it, it, it looked, if you half shut your eyes, it looked, you know, like the, like the Dorchester. But, you know, if you just, the light switches sort of, you turn it on, it fell off you know, and that kind of, <laughs> um, and you turn on the television, you've got an electric shock. You know, it, it was all of that. Um, but a huge restaurant and wonderful starch linen, a, a bevy of waiters all, all sort of clustered together in a corner and a, a, a menu and all this. And you had to wait hours to be served. And when they eventually came and you'd made up your mind, you, you looked through the menu and, and you just pointed at and yet, uh, and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet. And so out of this huge menu, there was only one thing that they had. And I thought they could have perhaps made it a bit simpler. <laughs> um, but what I liked about that is that there was no choice. You just had what was on for the day. And the menu that they gave you was, well, it was, it was probably what they might have got through in a year, perhaps, but it just happened to be that. And in the shop windows, you know, pyramids of pilchard, tins of pilchards and all the rest of it. And I know it was extreme, but I found that enormously um, attractive. And also the fact that there was no traffic other than um, taxis, trolley buses, and the occasional trabant which was a sort of people's car. And I, I loved all that. But th th just coming back to music, you know, it, it's th this business of of choice. You know, I, th I think it, it, is, it is an absolute tyranny. And in study, you know, who are you going to study with? What conservatory do you want to go? I mean, there's so many choices. There's so many choices of what course you do on. Well, in my day, it was just, just the one course, dead simple, and, the way. and now... It's just, I, I, I mean, even when I was teaching, I didn't know what I was teaching. <laughs> what, what, you know, I just, uh, in desperation towards the end of my teaching career, I used to ask the students, well, what's on the syllabus? What, 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 do, you, <laughs> what do you want me to teach you? Um, because it was so confusing. And I, I, I don't know why we've, we've in, in this era, why we've, we've got to this point of complexity of living. Um, and uh, accounting, this accountable culture. You hear it in the news. You, hardly a news bulletin goes by when there's not somebody or a politician or somebody that says something and an apology is demanded immediately or can you, can you apologize for that offensive statement or 25 years ago you did a Nazi salute to somebody and we, you know, we're not gonna invite you to the, I mean, it's, it, we've gone sort of mad about it or well, getting onto all sorts of subjects other than music perhaps that's really what I want to do but anyway ask me another is is the tyranny of choice sort of like a hindrance on one's attention and time oh yes of course it is tyranny of choice are you a person who doesn't like to waste time no that's an interesting observation no I don't but but um, to get back to the matter in, in hand, this business of why did I become a, a musician, um, this is going back, um, I, I felt, I did feel a sort of um, a drivenness, a desire to to play certain works. There were certain works I wanted to play. I wanted to play Rachmaninoff, Second Piano Concerto. I... I um, particularly that really and then I was asked to play the Greek and I enjoyed that but I, I always sort of I, I didn't have any I didn't have much initiative I, I liked it when people told me what to do and there was an occasion in 1973 at the Royal Academy when um, and I'd been there for about four or five four years by then and I was asked by the warden um, whether I would do the Paganini Rhapsody for a a youth orchestra in Leicester, the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news, it was in three weeks' time because somebody had perhaps fallen ill. Or whatever. So I was, that was the beginning of my career of fill-in folk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I've had a very big career of filling in and standing in. Um, and I remember getting the score, which I didn't have, and learning it with great excitement and pleasure. Um, I think I must have got a record of it and listened to it and thought, oh, wow, I like this. And I worked at it and, and got it, must have got it to quite a good point, and um, had a wonderful person to help me, Valerie Dixon. Uh, she now lives in America, and she, she married Stephen Savage, the, the pianist Stephen Savage. And she was um, a local teacher as well, and she played the orchestral part for me, and we crashed through it oh, many a time. And that became a, a staple piece of my career, and I recorded it, of course, later with the Royal Philharmonic. But I remember going on tour with the Leicestershire School's uh, Orchestra and uh, in France, and that was a wonderful, a wonderful time. of. Uh, it was wonderful being with... Well, a bit, they were all a bit younger than me. I mean, I was, what, 23, and they were 13, 14, 15. Ragged me because they because of the way I spoke and, the, and all that, uh, which I used to get quite a bit. And... Um, we had tremendous fun, and I really loved that. And I learnt, I think, qu quite a lot of things. Firstly, that I much preferred playing with other people and on my own. And that I loved concertos. Not because of being a soloist, that, that was the, the least pleasant side of it. It was the fact that I was, we're all in this together. And I've always felt that with concertos. I've never felt the soloist. I've always felt you know, come on, let's see what we can do with this and I'll, I'll do the best I can kind mm. of thing. Um, and I think that that was very fortuitous. And then about the same time, Simon Rattle, who was a um, pupil of Gordon Green and also a fellow Liv Liverpudlian, because Gordon Green came from Liverpool, um, he then uh, conducted the Merseyside Youth Orchestra and he, um, Simon asked me to do uh, Rack 3 with them. Rack Marinoff Third Piano Concerto, for those listeners who don't know what Rack 3 is. Um, viewers, I should say. So I, I, I learned rack, rack 3 for that. And that was quite a learn. Um, where was I living in 1970? I was still living at home at Jazz Cross, yeah. And I then had... Mazevich's piano, there's a story which I'll come to. But I, I, I mugged up Rack 3, but I, I didn't, I mean, it was, it was, I did the best I could with the equipment I had and the experience I had. And we did it, I think, did we do it three times? I'm, I'm quite muddled. It was Rack 2 I did with the Merseyside Youth Orchestra and Simon. It was Rack 2. And that went quite well. And shortly after, he asked me to do Rack 3. That was it. That was it. But what I'm saying is about that time, I was doing concertos mm -hmm. early on. And it, th that became the mainstay of my career and repertoire because I was asked to give recitals, which I find a bit of a pain. But I always I did them. And I did my Wigmore Hall in 1974. Hall, which was sponsored by the Arts Council for having won the 1973 National Federation of Music Societies Award. Uh, and one of the prizes was a Wigmore Hall, a sponsored Wigmore Hall. So we're jumping around a bit. Uh, butterfly mind. Um, but that was significant because it set me on the course of, of what was to be a really a concerto career with a few recitals thrown in, which were always, um, I won't say difficult, because I hope I did them successfully, but I didn't enjoy giving recitals, and mm. I don't enjoy giving recitals. You've had a phenomenal well, concerto career, actually. Mm. I think you mentioned with um, Murray McLuckin in an interview you did with him, I think you said something like a, a concerto a month for a year. No, I don't know. Though. We're going to that period which I talk about really probably too much yes yes it was it was an extraordinary period I I mean we're jumping forward a bit to uh, 
1980, so that's quite a bit, bit further forward. And that was, um, yes, I was mentioning the Moscow competition a moment ago, the three content contenders. I didn't get through to the third round. I got through to the second round. Uh, Christian and Terence got through to the third round. They got one round further. Um, and I always remember on my birthday, my 28th birthday, June 28th, 1978, I was walking through Red Square, having just come back from the jury room when we'd all been told who got into the semi-finals. And I was on my own walking through Red Square, I think Revolution Square it was, to back to the hotel, thinking I'm 28 today and I was going back to London and I had no concerts in the day and a bit of private teaching and it was quite a you know quite a quite a time quite, quite a moment of anxiety and I had an experience out of that moment of anxiety I felt it was a sort of transcendental moment of 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 um joy it was a sense of just, just I was feeling actually really rather nothing I just felt as i some unseen force was lifting me up. It was extraordinary. Um, I mean, I've never taken drugs or anything, but I could imagine it was, I was just, I felt suddenly taken out of myself. Anyway, I came back to London, the phone rang, and it was, I think, my then agent saying, um, I had a phone call from the BBC asking whether I'd like to do a prom. Uh, just out of the blue. Um, and uh, it was going to be the John Ireland Piano Concerto with the BBC Scottish and the, the young uh, up-and-coming conductor, Simon Rattle. So it was a nice thing to do because Simon had used me quite a bit. And so all that sort of started. And what's more, the icing on the head was televised. So you can imagine what I felt. I mean, it was, it was extraordinary career break but like so many career breaks I had I don't think I made the best of it because I was I was sort of thrilled and embarrassed in equal measure oh not me no, I just oh, I can't give it away you give it to somebody else you know I'm not good enough kind of thing and I think that's always slightly dogged me although I've tried to conceal it and um, anyway we did it and it, it went well and Robert Ponsby the then director of Radio 3 and the Proms, who only recently died and became a very, very dear friend, um, was pleased. And um, I had a run of about 12 Proms after that, another two televised. So the, the BBC really took me up. But that initially, I think, had come from the BBC piano competition of four years, five years earlier, the 1974 piano competition which uh, transmogrified into the Young Musician of the Year, but it started out as the BBC Piano Competition, in which I was a controversial second. Um, and on the jury was Fanny Waterman and Cyril Smith, probably a name you don't remember, uh, Cyril Smith, Phyllis Selick, Colin Horsley, Vlado Palmutar, Palmutar and... Was it Rosalind Turek or was she? No, she came later on Leeds. So, and I, 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 um, I think it. I, I, obviously made some impression on the BBC because I did the Pagani Rhapsody in the last round of that competition. So I, uh, anyway, so I did the um, Ireland Concerto, and then uh, that was nineteen seventy nine, and then in nineteen eighty, I changed agent to Mina K, K artists. And there, you have to change wheels because um, my life took 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 another another turn. She was dynamic, young, and she and her twin brother Tony ran this young, buzzy agent with all the latest technology. Faxes had just come in, and it was faxes, fax. That Nina was faxing all over the place. I should have called myself Philip Fax. <laughs> um, you know, it really was just amazing. And she had a knack of getting the dates, and big ones, big ones. 
and the orchestra orchestral date started absolutely you know um coming in like anything and um it was very heady time and i thought well this is it you know this is what what being a concert pianist is about and i didn't think it didn't cross my mind to plan seasons or repertoires or anything i just got you know from colina um she might say oh do you know the um what might it be the delius piano concerto and I, I would say, perhaps I might say yes and quickly go out and buy the music, you know. <laughs> and, you know, d do that kind of thing. And it, it came to a point where in 1983, yes, I had another prom. It was the um, Chopin E minor. And the BBC had also asked, asked me to understudy Claudio Arrau, uh, who was then getting getting on and had a tendency to cancel but I, I was selected to understudy him for the prom that he might not do so I had my own prom for sure and possibly another one but it so happened that I I'd never played the shop any of mine in my life I had a very busy 1983 two three season and I, I remember I'd be, I was on a duo tour with Christopher Warren Green, violinist, who was then the the, the concertmaster, the, the first violinist in the Philharmonia. And we'd been in Bulgaria for a tour. And that was in, in uh, what was it? I, anyway, it was about June or, or so, 1983. I, <coughs> excuse me. I came back to London and to Campbell Road, where I was living then, and I had, I looked at my calendar and I had five weeks, five clear weeks to learn the Chopin E minor. And I, by then I'd had a phone call from the BBC saying, you're on. <laughs> um, so I had five weeks, uh, Chopin E minor and the Strauss burlesque and the Weber Konschersstück. And even as I say the words now, I think, is this a true story? You know? <laughs> And I had the studio, I'd just finished it. I think I showed you how it looked in those days. And it was a very hot, muggy few weeks of summer. And I can remember, in, I was packing my underpants and a t-shirt, it was so hot, sweating away in the studio. And I set two, and I gave myself three weeks to learn it all, and then play it all through to, to invited audience in, in, the, in that studio. And I did it. And I sort of wobbled through the whole thing. I, 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 who would have played the second piano? Hamish, I think, would have. Hamish Milne um, would have. Uh, I'm sure he did because he and I all played together a lot. And um, I think I got one or two others. It, uh, Craig Shepherd was around. He was a great mate of mine in those days. Yes, I think it might have been Craig. Um, and I, I did it in three weeks uh, from memory so that I had the feeling of, I've, well, I've got two weeks. I've already played in public, played them all. I've got two weeks before going on live. And so that's what I did. But I, I was aware then, Anthony, as I am still, that I would never be the same again. <laughs> and that if this is what being a concert pianist involves, I, I, it's not for me. I can remember feeling that, but I had to put those those feelings, really pack them away tight, in order to to to, to bring it all off, which I did. And I've got the recordings and I've got the reviews. Although it's very interesting, the recordings, the reviews, are very mixed on the Chopin, but not on the Strauss and the the um, uh, Weber, uh, which were. Were, were glowing and uh, absurd, really. I mean, amazing. But the the, Stra the Chopin, I had two. I, I often quote these to to students to cheer them up, especially when they get bad exam results. All this because uh, one review in the Guardian was was glowing, and another review was you know where my sound was ringing and sure and sure. The other one sounded like breaking glass. You know. So what one person hears is not what another person hears. We all know that to be true. 
Um, but I think uh, I think they were quite perceptive reviews, and one of them was by Nick Kenyon, actually, who was then a before his BBC his BBC days. He 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 was it was a very good searching review. But anyway, I I was doing all that, and that was in 1983. And then, of course, it, it went on. It went on. I was recording, and I was getting a reputation for doing British concertos. I did a lot of British concertos. Um, and, and so it went on. So the BBC was, was a very, very big and important part of my life. Um, uh, and recording, I was hoping, would become a big part of my life, but never did. And I've often reflected on that. Um, so I, I did the Pagni Rhapsody and the um, Rack 2 and then I did Chike 1 and Chike 3 for classics for pleasure and I did Chopin Waltzes and the two sonatas. Well, the three I know, but B minor, B flat minor. Delius Concerto. Not much more. But I, I really loved recording, but it, it I don't know whether I mismanaged it or my agents, I don't know, but it never happened. And uh, I am, I'm a little sad about that because I was more comfortable in the, in the concert, in the recording studio than perhaps anywhere else. Why was that? I think, and I, I, I have reflected on this an awful lot. I, I think my career I mean, there was there was a short space of time, and I'm talking about the the time that it was, at a very big, at quite a peak. Um, I was also going to Italy, and, and things were developing there. But there was a sense in which I always felt, I won't say a fraud quite. It's, it wouldn't be. As, uh, I I knew I could do it, but that, and not that I was not worthy of it, but. Um, that, that I was, although I was in the thick of it, I was pulling away from it too simultaneously. Um, a sort of an embarrassment. I can always remember the sense, even as a young boy, although I put on a great show, and it's often been said in my reviews, if you see them, and a Philip Fogg, natural showman, you know, it's always, it's, that's always the thing they latch on. And I, I think, yes, I think that is true in many ways, but I also think that showmanship was was a, a facade, an elaborate uh, mechanism to conceal the sort of shrinking person beneath, uh, sort of pulling away from it all the time and yet trying to give the impression that I was doing quite the reverse. Mm. And this is why I think um, I'm very concerned in my teaching, I have to be very concerned, of not pushing people beyond what I think is appropriate for them, not what their parents might want or that their previous teacher might have expected. I'm interested in what I think is going on inside them. You know, the moment you put your hands on a keyboard or pull a string across a bow, make any, you know, you're, you, 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 you cannot actually conceal anything. And when I listen to my performances of the past, of this period, I, I'm, I, I'm struck sometimes by, my goodness, who's that? And is it me? My, you know, on the one hand. And on the other hand, I can hear what I'm, I can hear in a sense, I won't say artificiality, but I, I, I can hear me. I can hear me. It's sort of the two me's. It's it's an extraordinary thing. The the the, um, the uh, not quite conflict, but the the uh, contrast between the the extrovert and the the the, the introvert. And uh, I I think that was, but I think that it might not be just me who has this but it's it's uh i found that i won't say i found it difficult but i think that the maintaining that kind of tension uh caught up with me uh, particularly with my memory because i was memorizing so much so quickly 
and I really was. So there was a. I, I, I did learn nine concertos in nine months. I remember I totted it up, all from memory. Um, well, this this comes at a cost. I mean, I'm not a genius. I have to work hard. I haven't got a photographic memory. I'm not like John Ogden or, or I th I'm sure Tchaikovsky, who both. I mean, you've got to be autistic to to to. to quite serious and, it, it, and I think this is another thing with performing you know, you've got to be a, a bit of a monster really sort of you know when you think of the great performers they're all monsters um, and it, it came at great cost and, and it came to a head really when I was about 40 I, I would say so I, I went on quite quite a while at a very high level um, so that's why going back to an earlier conversation I, I've I've loved teaching I've always loved teaching it's never been fair to me I, I taught right from the from the beginning so I've always loved to help people and enable them um, because I've had to do exactly the same thing for myself and I don't make any distinction between teaching somebody the complexities of rack three or whatever it may be or just playing two consecutive notes in a five finger exercise it just, I, I, I don't make any distinction. Perhaps I should, but I don't. The sense of achievement of somebody playing that or playing Fair Elise evenly for the first time in their lives is the joy on their face if you give them a little trick or an exercise just to help things along is immense. And that's, that's far greater satisfaction than, than doing it oneself. Mm. So um, there are a lot of things to think about. You know, performing is a very, very complicated thing. Uh, my dear aunt has always taken the view that, well, it can't be difficult because you can do it. Well, you know, end of discussion. Well, I could, so it's the end of this discussion. Well, you can do it. So it's easy for you. But it isn't. I don't think it's easy for anyone. Um, I think there are a few people absolutely born to it. But I think it, it, is, it is a tough, a tough business. Um, and I think you've got to be doing it for the right reasons. The, the, the psychological, emotional, musical wiring has all got to be absolutely in place. And I can, I can spot a mile off, I would say, when it isn't, having to struggle with my own pretty mixed up wiring. Um, so it's very interesting. So when I said to you earlier, I feel I've got something to say, I mean, you asked me what I'm doing, having announced my withdraw from public performing it's this in fact I said to you earlier you put the mic in front of me I didn't know what I was going to say and I'm going to be very interested in what I'm going to say and I'm actually am <laughs> because it's coming out in a different way to what I might have I didn't know I wasn't prepared for anything but it's so much in my mind it's such a big thing I and I think without wanting to be conceited I think it's such an important thing to get across to people is that love of music and ability to do it is great, but there's a lot more to it than that. What was the, if there was, what was the underlying motivation to work so hard? Because very recently, I think it was about three years ago, um, I was sleeping. And in the darkness, I had this very lucid dream about my own mortality. And that night just changed my life because I realized that I had a very finite time in this hour. Not only that, it was also coupled with very high expectations for my family. Being the eldest and being, being the sort of not victim but say the the subject of a lot of investment emotional investment and financial investment for me to do well so this this pressure from that and also the pressure of living life in in the best way possible sort of developed this quixotic attitude of wanting to do as much as you can in the time that you have on this hour and this is why I, I work so hard. This is why I do this. And this is why I, I try to network with as many people as possible. And sometimes that can have a drastic effect on 
the way I deal with my other parts of my life, so my personal life. But and I get some friends tell me you should you should slow it down. You should give some time off. You should have some days where you do nothing. But then I say to them, well, I don't I don't really want to because a it's not making me unhappy working, and b I don't have much time on this earth. <laughs> To do the things I I want to do. I think for me that's one of the strongest factors. This quixotic quixotic attitude of trying to achieve as much as I can on this earth, to squeeze as many amps, to take some a quote from Apollo thirteen I just watched yesterday, and um, to squeeze as many amps from this life as possible to get me home, and I, that's one of my motivations. I, I wondered if you resonated with any of that. I think it's a very, I, I think that's very understandable, and I I. I I would I I I I share that. I think it I think that it 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 changes as as life goes on. But but, um, I mean I think I think that's that's good and and I think it's wholesome and natural. You know, when you're young, that's what you want to do. Um, I'm just trying to think back. It's so hard to think back. You know, over fifty years, from where one is now to to where one was, because one can edit one's thoughts in the light of how you think now hmm. and I, that, I, that's why i think it's it's very very dangerous to say you know uh, i thought this at the time and i thought that uh, you know I, i'm not quite sure what i thought at the time and you know there's a lot of guessing but but uh, i have fortunately kept my diary so i can i can i, I you know i was and i did i did go on retreats and i did go away and i did go for walks and, and, and i but possibly not enough and then, of course, you've got the pressure of earning, having to living and all the rest of it. So there's just the sheer, the sheer business of that. But I, th I think, and it's easy for somebody of my age to say to you of your age that you know we had more time. And I don't think that's probably necessarily true. I, I, I do think we possibly had less. We didn't have the social media, which is which is a huge pressure actually. Um, I, th I think that has significantly changed everybody's lives. Um, you know, we didn't go around prodding phones all the time. We actually, I think there were more opportunities for being on your own or being quiet. And I think there, there are not so many now. You've really got to make the space and there's everything to encourage you not to. Every distraction. It's very addictive, all this stuff. I mean, I find myself doing it. To my horror, I'm doing it too. <laughs> you know, I think. Um, so um, I, I don't think you need castigate yourself for that i i think the awareness of it is 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 good enough if you're aware that you're you might be pushing things and and just see if you can occasionally just think well i this afternoon i get to keep free and just just um do something totally different or, or just just you know if you want to be religious about it but just you know that kind of thing i do think doing something completely different uh, is important and it's amazing how we don't we don't think the obvious for example you know I, I i think one of the most dangerous things in practice is repetition uh, people just seem to have uh, gordon green used to talk about developing a box of tools like a craftsman you know master craftsman be it a a, a carver or you can imagine all these chisels he used to say well it's a beautiful velvet lined box and a chisel for every single curlicue on that intricate wood carving you know different thing all beautifully oiled and ready you know and that's your your practicing kit you know it's got to be like that and i feel and i like to tease people that you know what's it what's in your practicing box what 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 what, what are your tools there and Actually, they haven't got a box at all, let alone any tools. But if they have got a container of any sort, there'll be a sort of blunt screwdriver that doubles as a chisel and a repeat button, uh, just a repeat button. Uh, and, you know, well, what else is there? You know, and that's it. That's it. Um, so you only have to go down any corridor of any college and you'll hear the piano being bashed loudly and repeat, 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 repeat. And I've always been worried about this because, I mean, repetition is part of it. It has to be. But it's what you repeat, why you repeat, how you repeat. Uh, 
and the dynamic level at which you repeat. And I, I, when I hear people practicing, it sounds, it sounds as though there's a sort of panic in it, a franticness, a drivenness. And if they do get it right, whatever getting it right may be, it it's becomes addictive. Well, I got it right. I'll just do it again to make sure it's right. And uh, that was good. And I'll just just uh, I'll just be sure. And it goes on right to the minute of walking onto the exam or this. You've got your friend. Well, you know this is this is this is, and it sounds like that. It's frantic. You know, get it right, get it right, get it right. Go into the exam, you get it wrong. Um, uh, Gordon Green used to say, "You must practice." You mustn't practice so you get it right. You must practice so you never get it wrong. Mm. Um, it sounds so simple, but it's, it's, it's a lifetime sort of thing to achieve that. But you can learn, and with good counselling, to work on one's vulnerabilities and see, anticipate where difficulties, problems may arise. Take nothing but nothing for granted. Every finger must not only know its duty, but it must know the duties of all its companions. And I find that people just play as though their fingers are all prima donnas. They're just doing their own thing. Get out of my way. It's my go. And they've got no sense of collaboration. Collaborative, choreographic fingering just seems to, doesn't seem to exist. You know, um, you play one finger and I say, well, what are the others doing? Well, they, they don't have to play yet. Yes, but wh where are they? Are they in transit? They're always in transit. Where, where's the flight path? Where's it going to? Why is your hand closed up when you play the second finger when it's actually got to be up there? You know, that, but people don't, don't know. And you can do that kind of practice in silence. Hmm. And furthermore, you can do it away from the keyboard. And I, I think a lot of teaching is too many words too much fiddling around, too much noise, teachers putting circles in students' scores and wavy lines and shooting arrows. And instead of just saying, well, now let's, let's talk about this, sitting on a table like you, you and I are now, and uh, let's talk this through. What would you do in that bar? Oh, I don't know, but, uh, you know. And you begin to see things and you begin to hear things that you don't when you're actually at the piano. So I've got this sort of theory that one could do that one can do good teaching and good learning and good performing without noise, without sound. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you know th what you want up here, it's going to be far less of a problem down there. But people try and do the, so they hear it, they hear it wrong before it gets right. I always say, hear it right, right at the beginning. And do it right, right at the beginning. Instead of, oh, I played an F natural, correct it in the moment. So I've heard two things. There's confusion. And yet people do that hours and hours of doing this, sort of correcting in the moment, instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to get this right, and then stopping when they feel uncertain and holding it. Don't stop and lift your hands. You've covered your tracks. You've covered your footprints. You've got to see the footprints. You've got to see the journey. You know, all this sort of stuff. Well, you can do that away from the piano. You're grinning from ear to ear. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. And it's peaceful, you see. You can, you can, you can do things in tranquility and pleasure instead of anxiety. And shoulders up. And, and posture and all these things, it, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. But these things are not addressed. And I've got distinguished colleagues. I have wonderful musicians and experienced performers even. Uh, you know, if I taught the p piano to beginners... I do away with primers, all these things. Ghastly picture of a keyboard, you know, and a, a finger with one, two, three, four, you know. And that, the, 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 the most tyrannous note invented by God or man, middle C, which if I could abolish middle C, I would. Um, and that's the first finger that the poor old thumb gets to know. Well, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do any of that. I would say, what does a, child do when it goes to a piano for the Caesar piano it, it does this you know that, that, and all the rest of it and provided it hasn't got jam on its fingers I say go ahead you know go on let, now tell me a story you know, tell me a story I don't mind just snap 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 it's fine it's fine by me the whole of the keyboard black notes white notes the whole damn lot none of this uh, um, enjoy it did you enjoy that yes and you can, uh, there we go then then you can 
see how the child responds, and then you can perhaps sit it, sit him or her on your knee or whatever, and say, well, now can you see some notes that look the same, and it might play a, a black note, and say, can you, do you see another one that looks just like that, like Kit Kats, you know, the <laughs> three bits of chocolate, you know, that kind of thing. Make games and just say that they completely. The whole keyboard becomes their friend in their first encounter. But this keyboard apartheid of the blacks and the whites, you know, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. It still goes on. It baffles me. And the other thing I would do is get a child or even an adult or oh, student. It doesn't have to be a child. Is just put your hands on the keyboard and any cluster of notes or even one note. Just one note. Just put it. And hold it till you can't hear it anymore. Just hold it right to the very end of its last dying gasp. And hold it. Don't grab it. Don't have your shoulder. Just hold it and feel completely comfortable as the sound fades. That would be lesson one. <laughs> but just never that. Just I've got to do a tune straight away. And I, I would I would I think I would say now before we do a tune, we've got to learn to listen. Has that sort of approach to music um, influenced you anywhere other in life apart from music? The way you think about how to practice. So I'm not. I'm not quite clear. Um, has what influenced me? So the your your approach to practicing. Yes how to get better at something mm. this mythological way of getting better does it apply to other things yes yes um possibly I, i'm not sort of i am aware that i've forgotten for example if you get those flat pack things you know with building furniture with tables with coffee which i've did a whole kitchen that um, one house i had and um, and I, I have to be very, very methodical, and put out every screw and every nut and every washer, you know. And when I'm doing, um, for example, I've just come back from New Zealand and I built a greenhouse for my wife, which I loved, out of junk wood from the dump. And I have to be very, very organised with my tools. You know, if I use a saw once, I put it back immediately. Now this is a touch of OCD, I think, in some ways. Um, but I don't see myself as particularly OCD, but I can, you know, one's got to be honest. Um, but I, I I do like to know where things are because I'm very scatterbrained, I think. Curiously enough, I think people who are untidy often have tidy minds, and people who are very tidy have untidy minds. And I think I've, I, I am tidy, but I think my mind is absolutely chaotic. Now, my brother has got an extraordinary tidy mind, but he's not as tidy as I am. <laughs> um, and, and so I think, uh, yes, it does does rub off on mm. other things. But I keep on coming back to really the thing that ha has become quite an issue for me is sound, noise, and silence. Because um, music is, is so much part of all that. And I had... A, you know, I can't, well, I, I don't teach at college anymore, but I, I'm always happy to hear, you just mentioned it, you know, people play through and I do, I've learned to Zoom and all that, with, with just using a laptop, I'm not clever with all these things that you have. Um, but I can do sufficient. Um, and I find that it, it rather suits what I'm talking about. For example, if, if you were to do anything play to me, I I would suggest that you might write down page line and bar of anything you want to talk about specifically and it could be any issue at all phrasing fingering whatever um, and send me a, a scan of your score then I can look at it and then we can have a zoom and, and go through it on that that basis and I find having it and that sort of formulate way saves you know this it, you have to be you can't waste time on these things you've got to get it 
absolutely right. That's that's a way I found quite helpful. And the other one is for people to pre pre record something, send it in a file, and then I can make comments, and then I write an email. Um, or perhaps do a Skype, or, but that kind of thing. But I, I like this business of um, working in bits. And I always say to students, and this might be helpful or might not, um, you know, a student might in the past say, oh, can I cancel my lesson because I'm not ready? And I say, no. Um, that is, I don't want you to be ready. I'm, I'm not interested. Well, when you're ready, well, that's great. Uh, hurrah. You know, that's, you needn't come if you're ready. It's when you're not ready that, that the work is, is interesting. I don't want to have a, be presented with a, with a finished product. Something's ready. I want to be finished. I want to go into the engine room with all the oily rags and steam and mess and not, and not get, and, you know, get, see what's going on. It's like maybe baking a cake. I want to know what's in the ingredients. I don't need a bit more salt and a bit more of this and put more of that. And uh, let's uh, mix it next week and perhaps. Uh, and then when we're both happy, we can put it in the oven. Then it'll be ready. And I always find that, you know, when people, uh, students say, I've been practicing an awful lot this week, I say, I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> you know, oh dear, oh dear, what on earth are you going to serve up, you know? <laughs> uh. Uh, I'd like to move on to, to friendship, probably the second to last segment. Um, I'm reading a novel that's lent to me by James, actually, my teacher, James Kirby. It's called An Equal Music by Vikram Seth. Oh, yes. Have you, have you read I it? I think I have. Yes. I'm not sure if you remember, there's a line in the first, I think... It's, it's to do with a quartet. That's right. Yes. And... There was a line in the first few chapters that really caught my attention. They were rehearsing with their quartet. I think it was it must have been Haydn because the quote was referenced to Haydn. And it said, um, "We all love Haydn. Haydn makes us love each other." Has music ever brought you closer with someone, or started a, a friendship? Your mutual love of music of the same type of music. This is a very, very important question. Um, is it, this is a really I, I really need to yes. think about that uh, I mean I have found sharing music very difficult but I, I, I this is I, I can share it in teaching, I think more more than any other way, because <laughs> I'm 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 paid to share it as a witness, but it's not not as simple as that. I'm at some level I'm embarrassed by sharing music. It's so private. I I have a long conversation with my wife. We have to, you know she loves listening to music at a certain time of day, six you know with a drink at six o'clock in the evening. I don't. That's the time I absolutely don't want to. So there's a little conflict on that one, and it's 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 I, I, sitting down and listening to music. So I would put on a record for a student, where I would not put a record down on for myself. Um, now does that answer your question? Anyway, I, I'm much more comfortable sharing in that way, and yes, I suppose it does bring me closer. But there is a uh, you've touched on something with regard to me which is um, a bit unresolved. You see, I, I, my love of Gregorian chant, for example, is that has brought me close to monastic communities in a very, a very particular, and I would say a very profound way. Um, and there are some students who are working at, uh, have worked at pieces that we both, uh, it, it's really, thrillingly exciting because they they respond in exactly this and that's that is wonderful yes and that yes you're i mean it does there is a there is a bond and a closeness that inner part shared you know that that's the stuff you know and that's great it's it's a it's a lovely warm moment but it, i do uh, when the lesson's over and i'm on to the next thing it's i won't say raised but it's um 
it's very compartmentalized. Um, I think this is a very significant thing. And I, this is one of the things I want to express much better than I am doing now. See, performing has been a, a, an intensely private thing one has to do in public. And so I've had to sort of clothe it in in a in a a mantle of of exuberance and and showmanship to conceal the vulnerability really uh, because that comes to me more naturally than wishing to express what I want to express as it were or wishing to share what I want to share. I'm sort of embarrassed. I, 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 it, it's a sort of almost a deflection. Yes, I want you to hear what I have to say, but, you know, cheerfully waving kind of thing. And um, it's a very interesting, a very interesting question which I need to think about. Mm. Um, I envy a number of my colleagues. Uh, 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 they're on, their names are on my lips, but I, I feel it's really prudent, probably. But I, I, I'm, it might be arrogant for me to think that they don't have such feelings. But I can think of people who just seem to play uncomplicatedly for the pleasure of it. They can read through a piece, mug it up, repeat it a few times, and you know, off they go. And I, I rejoice in that. I, I, and I feel that that's, that's how it should be. But it never has been for me. Um, I've not been able to do that. And there's a sort of feeling, Anthony, sadness perhaps possibly, that, that I, I should have been able to do it, but something in me blocked it or didn't allow it at some level or didn't actually want it. I think being an artist, being an innate artist is... A complicated life. I think it? it's an enormous complication. See, I I fight shy of that. I couldn't. I I feel embarrassed to be thought of as an artist, or even to think talk of myself as an artist. It's it's a it's a job of work. Who was it who said it was a job of work? I I had the great good fortune of meeting one of the great actresses of the last century, Dame Flora Robson, and she was long retired. But I met her because I was doing. Carnival of the Animals, and she was narrating the Ogden Nash first, which often can go with it. And I was doing it with Peter Catin, who was a wonderful help to me. He was a big name in those days, Peter Catin. And we were doing, about 1974, Carnival of the Animals. And I got to know uh, her then, and she was lovely. She was in her 80s. She long retired from stage and film. And she, I think she rather liked young men, to be honest. Which was now fine, suited me well, and um, so she invited me down to her house in Brighton uh, um, for for lunch, and she talked about all the great actors of the day and uh, Gielgud and um, Laurence Olivier, Tyrone Guthrie. She she was and how it was filming in the nineteen thirties. I mean, my goodness me, to be party to all this stuff. I I was so young and green I didn't really take it all in but I do remember her saying because I, I, I think I asked silly fatuous questions like did you get nervous and how do you remember your lines <laughs> um, and she said well you know waiting in the wings she, she was a woman of deep faith she said I, I say to the Lord I've done my work now you do yours <laughs> and I've always rather liked that yeah in other words, it is. And Gordon Green used to say, "Performing is a lottery. It's an absolute lottery. It's 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 a real. It can be a real bummer because you can walk on the stage, feeling prepared and good, and, and really right up to the moment, you actually put the keys down and just suddenly it hits you. Uh, and then, that which is awful. Other times, and I've had it. I've felt, oh my God, I really don't know. I, what am I doing here? wobble to the piano and feel as, as absolutely rock solid and it just uh, before i know um it, it's finished it's over and it's um i remember that happened in with a 
concerto, the Bliss Piano Concerto, which I I did at the Fairfield Hall, and I just and it's a hugely complicated work, and I the first time out and from memory, and I remember thinking, I just this is it was fine, it was fine, and again it can be bad when you think, well, at the end of a concert that was that was I, I that was as bad as good as I can do and better than I deserve, and I that, I feel okay that was. And it was recorded, and you think, well, I, I I could bear to hear that. I think I'll I might listen to that, and it's awful. <laughs> I've had that experience of thinking, well, that was not the, not a bad job, and listen to it not long after, thinking that's absolutely terrible. How could I think that was so good? Uh, and conversely, I, I've come off thinking, oh God, that was pretty. The BBC won't want that, and then I hear the broadcast and think, oh well, now that bit's coming where I, oh. Oh, didn't even hear it. So it's it's so many many things. Gordon Green used to say that one's best performances are often when you're the most attached, and it's as though you're in a control box, and you're you're the lighting engineer, you're the producer, you're the director, you're the prompt lighting engineer. You're doing all these things quite consciously. A bit more lighting here. Don't forget your lines there. You've got to move over there and all this. And you just see this thing happening and then it's over and there's applause and you're walking off. And that that's happened to me on one or two occasions and it has gone well. I think it's, it is true. It's when people flail around and sort of feel the music and be <laughs> terribly artistic, ghastly, <laughs> frightful stuff. And of course, you know, people students copy all this stuff, all the gestures and the snorting and the shifting and the wiping their feet on the floor and stamping the pedals. And this just, it just all goes unchecked. And they get roars of applause for really shocking, shocking stuff that shouldn't be allowed. Mm. The movements don't seem to translate. Well, no, I, it, I find this excess movement has now become... Really, it's, it's really terrible. And also this sort of mincing conducting of the hand you see quite often when there's a, a solo bit in the right. It's, it's, it's yeah. terrible. Yeah. It's, it's very prevalent. Uh, but uh, teachers don't seem to check it or even be aware of it. Mm. Mm. How did you meet Shura Dukaski? Hmm. Ah, well, Shura. How did I meet him? Yeah. Good question. I think I must have gone backstage to some of his concerts, but the the uh, it, it's what I what I remember is inviting him, so I must have known him or met him somewhere before. But when I really got to know him was when mm. I gave a Queen Elizabeth Hall recital. And even as I say this, you see, I feel I'm talking about somebody else. I think did I do that? <laughs> And what's more, I played all the Chopin waltzes in the first half. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> and in the second half, Rachmaninoff's second piano sonata, in the original version. Well, I, 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 I oh. anyway, um, Short Chikaski came to the concert, and he came backstage, and he was very, very. So I'm embarrassed to say it, but he he was why, why can't I say he he really loved it. I've never said that to anybody. I've always sort of tried to dress it up. But he he was, and he he asked me. He said, "Philip, um, he had a slightly drawly. I can't imitate him. Slightly drawly, uh, camp American accent, um, New York. Uh, Philip, are you English? And um, sure, no, 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 sure, I'm not English. Are you sure <laughs> you're not English? And I said, I'm absolutely sure. And he, he, he sort of shook his head. Well, you don't play like an Englishman. <laughs> and um, I, I've always taken that as a compliment and I'm, to my distinguished English pianist who might be watching me. Um, please forgive me, fair <laughs> colleagues. Um, but that is what he said. And um, I, I rather treasure that, I have to say. Uh, and then after that, he used to invite me to the White House Hotel, which is where he had a, a room, um, a tiny little room at the corner of a corridor. And he had a little model of Steinway, closed, of course, with all his music on top and velvet curtains. And it was just 
you know. And that's where he did all his, his work. Um, and we, I remember we walked into Regent's Park and um, he, his conversation was a little limited. He loved talking about travel, um, aeroplane timetables. He, he was encyclopedic about that kind of thing. And I, again, I asked him sort of rather fatuous questions like, um, do you have any tips about practicing and, uh, and that kind of thing? And he did. Um, he, he said two things which have always struck me and I think uh, disappointed me at the time, but I've reflected them over the years. And I think they're wonderful. And they're, he said these two things. Uh, if you heard me practice, you wouldn't think I could play the piano. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I remember him saying that. I, except he, the first thing he said is, "Have you ever heard me play the uh, practice?" I said, "No, sure, I haven't heard you play the practice." If you thought, you know, and that's when he said that, um, and I, I love that because it's so true. I like to say to students, if I recognise what you're practicing, if I pass your room in the college, you're not practicing. Um, and the other thing he said was um, oh, about practicing for for uh, for us to the absolute second. But the other tip he he. Um, gave me he said well and he thought a bit and I think he did a gesture rather like this he said I I play every note right in the middle <laughs> and I remember thinking I'm talking to one of the great pianists of the <laughs> 20th century this could be the sort of thing you give a child for its first lesson you know finger on the middle of middle C kind of stuff mm. um, but when you watch him playing and of course it's uh, it's 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 um but he didn't say much else he he was just one of these instinctive musicians and i can remember jimmy gibb whom james would, would remember wonderful man wonderful musician incredible wit he told me a story of um shura phoned him up saying jimmy could you come around and run a concerto for me it was something quite complex like prokofiev 2 or something really toughy i seem to remember and uh, Jimmy went round and, and went through and Shura said right I want to go through the concerto twice because I haven't done it before I haven't done it for years and he the first time uh, he said I want to do it very very slowly so Jimmy laboriously went through the thing really slowly um, and uh, I think he had the music even I think he was going through with the music and they went through and waded through the thing and then sure, sure I had a glass of water or something and then said, right, okay. Um, and then played it and uh, through from memory and um, Jimmy said it was simply wonderful. <laughs> you know, absolutely just, just went through it. I mean, that's genius. That's genius. Another person who had that level of genius was John Ogden. And I can remember Gordon Green telling me, telling us that... Um, you know, he he had a photographic memory, and when he was going over, flying over to Moscow, he was sort of memorizing scores on the plane, that kind of thing. But it was his he 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 was certainly autistic, I would say, on the, on the, more than on the spectrum. Um, uh, but a, a genius, and of course, people think that you know, if you're autistic, you can be emotionally uh, have difficulties, which is perfectly true. But I've 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 seen and heard autistic people who are actually known to be autistic um, and they can play extremely expressively you give them an instrument but they can't communicate verbally uh, in the same way but the moment they touch the keyboard it reduces you to tears so it's it's a very complex thing but I sure certainly had it and he could move me to tears um, John Ogden could play beautifully of course as we know but that level it, it's it's an extraordinary gift um, and then we're coming back to the, the whole business of Talent. But that's how I got to know Shura Tchaikovsky. And uh, he was, um, I was going to say he was a complex man, but I, I'm, I'm not so sure. But he was a very lonely and a very unhappy man. But he was one of the few people I can really cite who got, who simply got better and better and better and better. And if you hear his last recording live, and it was so much of him, of course, fortunately, on YouTube. I mean, right up, right up to the end, he was playing immaculately. Absolutely. Hmm. Was there anything about him, about his sort of social side that impressed you? Social side? Yeah. 
not so not on the on, on the stage or with the piano just this on this sort of well, I think I've got to be a bit careful here I think uh, this is uh, uh, I mean sure uh, he 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 loved his friends. He liked he liked being in touch. Um, he liked he liked being with the people that, that that he knew. He was very he got very easy. He used to say, "I get so bored <laughs> when people talk about um, music or ask him what he's doing. He just gets so bored." He, I don't think he was a man who was interested in literature or conversation. He he lived. He lived for the piano and for audiences. An audience, give, give sure an audience, and he was where he had to be. But if, it, it, he was truly at home on stage. I remember him saying he used to have to, all his little, um, he was very superstitious and he had to have so many steps to the piano from, from the, when he walked from the you know, green room to the piano, it always had to be a certain number of steps. And um, he always liked certain things backstage. Ice cream, I think, was one of it, and masses of tissue paper, and grapes, you know, things like that. Well, that's we. All, I think that's all, all good and wholesome stuff. But he was very superstitious. I do remember him telling that. And he was really more interested in the piano stool than the piano. The piano. If the piano stool wasn't right, he was he got very distressed. But um, he didn't really mind about the piano. But the piano stool was very important. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think he also used to when you walked on stage, it was always the right foot first or left. It was yeah, it was that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I must say that for me, I, I dread it when people say who's your favorite pianist all this. Week. But I, I, I can truthfully say that um, you know he's 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 my desert island pianist really. Of course, I also got to know Eileen Joyce very well, um, and th that's another story and a great privilege. Um, uh, she was. My heart goes out to her, even at the time, because I got to know her when I was really getting pretty big time. I met her when I did the Island Concerto. And of course, she'd recorded it in 1940. Mm. And she'd also played it at the proms in 1949 on the occasion of Ireland's 70th birthday. <gasps> a year younger than I am now. And um, I got a recording of that too, of the of her performance of that. So when I was asked to do it in 1979 for the um, 100th anniversary of Ireland's birth, uh, she was very interested. And we had a mutual friend, so it was through. And uh, she came to my studio in Pimlico and heard me play it through on two pianos. So that was a wonderful thing. Then she invited me down to her house, which was then Chartwell Manor Farm in Kent. And uh, a very our friendship blossomed and I used to go and see her often and she'd long since stopped playing but she'd had a brief comeback in 1967 which I believe was not an entire success but I've I've I don't know much about it it was at the Albert Hall and she did rack two but I think it might have been all right but I think she was just it was that she was not comfortable and um so 1967 now I'm talking about 1980 or so and I used to go down, and she gave two. Um, she wanted to play the piano, but she would only do it if I was a duet with her, a duet or two pianos. She would do that, and it was incredible because I, I could see her fingers still, with those amazing Eileen Joyce fingers. But although they were terribly straightforward little concerts, um, in in my friend's home down in um, Sussex, Kent rather you know, with just local people, like giving one here. She was a absolutely in a state, you know, she was absolutely you know, drenched with sweat, you know, all the rest of it. And I thought, hmm, there's a story here, there's a story here. And we th did things like Scaramouche and Jamaican Rumba and uh, Entry of the Queen of Sheba. I mean, they're real, just, she she would do those. Um, oh, the Walton Facade, um, the um, waltz for the... Da da la dum ba dum ba dum ba da da la dum ba dum. A very clever arrangement. She liked doing that. Um, but I sensed then that her career, which had been, she was something of a 
latter day Van Cliven, you know, she had this, not that she won a competition, but she had this meteoric r rise. Um, and then the war came and she was playing three, four concertos a night up and down the country and all the rest of it. A huge repertoire. And then she got back problems. And and by the by the 50s, she was struggling a bit and she started playing the harpsichord and trying to find other avenues. And it all began to, to, to not quite work. And then by the time, in 1960, when she was in, well, only 50, she, announced, she called it a day. Um, but I always sensed that she, um, it had been a struggle for her, for all the glitter, glamour and success. And I, 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 I don't know, so I might be rewriting my, my feelings and her feelings in the light of what I feel now. But I sense there was a very strong rapport between us. Because I, I, perhaps it's because I like to feel that she could see in me an ambivalence, um, which there certainly was, but I was trying to conceal it. I, I wish we could talk all day, but I'm going to get to yeah. the last question now. Okay. Um, it's been a pleasure. Well, I'm talking far too much. But a lot of interesting stuff. Mm. Um, I'm sorry about that noise. No, 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 it's okay. Um, in your successful and long career in music, is there a piece of music that you feel, or pieces of music that you feel like they were written especially for you, physically and musically? You just felt at one with the piece, or was there no such thing? Yes, the Grieg Piano Concerto. Now, I'm sure many people would um, say that as well. Uh, but I think the Grieg, and second to the Grieg, would be the Pagani Rhapsody. Um, it's like a warm glove. <laughs> I know that feeling. Lucky you. <laughs> Maybe that would change. Hmm? Maybe that would change. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think so. Oh, for, oh, piano music, yeah. Mm. But um, it's funny. I I I sometimes fantasize about um, my funeral. Um, it's a rather strange thing to fantasize about, you might say. But if I were to have a funeral, if I were to have music, what would I have? Um, and. I've thought about it and even drafted a list. But, you know, I'm not so sure that I want anything. What I'd like is silence. Philip, thank you very much. Thank you.